Little Plum, Chapter 3 The weather grew colder and colder until one day snow began to fall. It fell all the morning, and by the afternoon the road, the roofs, and the gardens, the whole of Top Meadow was white with snow. Then the sky cleared, the sun came out, the frost sparkled, and Nona brought Miss Happiness and Miss Flower out to see the snowy world. The dolls wore warm coats over their kimonos, coats wadded and quilted with cotton wool. Over their painted sandals they had warm white socks, and Tom had made them tiny clogs cut from a cork and tied on with cords of embroidery cotton. Their heads were protected by round, flat hats tied under their chins. Nona brought them down as far as the low wall that bounded the Fells' garden from the road. She made them walk up and down along the wall. Their feet left footprints in the snow, smaller than a bird's. Belinda came to look. What are you doing, Nona? Miss Happiness and Miss Flower have come out to admire the snow. Is that what they do in Japan? My book says so. You might have told me, said Belinda. I would have brought Little Peach. Little Peach was a Japanese boy baby doll, no bigger than my thumb. He had come to Belinda in a peach, as Peach Boy in the Japanese fairy tale had come. Now Belinda ran up to her bedroom and fetched him. Little Peach's hair was cut round, his legs were curved like a baby's, and he had no clothes. Belinda's had lost his coat and Belinda had lost his coat and trousers and had not had time to make him any more. Belinda never had enough time, but she had wrapped him in a handkerchief. Now, you keep him, she said to Nona. Nona was used to keeping Little Peach. Belinda always had so many other things to do, and now Nona tied him on Miss Flower's back in the way that Japanese girls often carry their baby brothers. She had just begun to make them walk up and down in the wall again when the next door gate opened and out came Mr. Tiffany Jones. He stopped when he saw them, then came closer, bending his height down to look. How very pretty, said Mr. Tiffany Jones, gazing down at Miss Happiness, Miss Flower, and Little Peach. May I touch? And when Nona shyly nodded, he picked up Miss Happiness. Why, you have made them Tanzan, proper Japanese coats. And Tabi, he said, touching the socks. Tabi means foot bag in Japanese, and Tabi are like bags with one toe for the big toe. Nona, of course, had not been able to separate the doll's toes, but their warm white socks did look like tiny bags. Lucky little dolls, they are beautifully warm, said Mr. Tiffany Jones, gently putting Miss Happiness down. What are they called? Nona told him their names, and they have come out to admire the snow, Belinda explained. Japanese people do. So they do, said Mr. Tiffany Jones, and I believe they make up poems about it, or say one. And standing in the road, in all his elegance, Mr. Tiffany Jones recited, All heaven and earth in flowered white, hidden in snow, unceasing snow. Why, that's a haiku, cried Nona, delighted. A haiku is one of the smallest Japanese poems, only 17 syllables long, just right for dolls. And if Miss Happiness and Miss Flowers' little plaster faces could have smiled, they would have given the honorable gentleman a smile, and they would have bowed to him. Japanese people bow a great deal, and they speak of people as honorable. How do you know about Japanese things, said Belinda to Mr. Tiffany Jones. Nona knows, and Mr. Twilfit, but how do you know? Well, I go to Japan sometimes, said Mr. Tiffany Jones. As a matter of fact, I'm going there tomorrow for three or four days. Did he say three or four days, asked Belinda, but when he had gone on down the road, but Japan's on the other side of the world. Nowadays, people fly all over the world very quickly, Oh, Nona told her, and father said that too. Mr. Tiffany Jones, father said, was an important person in business. He might very well fly to Japan for just one meeting, said father. Before Mr. Tiffany Jones had walked away, he had bent down and picked Miss Flower up to look at her. Charming, he said touching Miss Flower's red hat with a gentle finger. And I wish my little girl could play with this, play like this, he said, and he wished. He had not sounded important, only wistful. You know, said Mother a few days afterwards, I'm beginning to feel sorry for that little girl. What little girl? Nona and Belinda did not quite follow Mother. What little girl? Jem, I am sorry for her. Sorry for Jem? Yes, said Mother. But she has everything, said Nona. Look at the things she has, said Belinda. One that particularly filled Belinda with envy was Jem's pony. Almost every day, the riding master from the stables near the park would ride up to the house next door, and beside his horse trotted a white pony, glossy white, with a long white mane and tail, the daintiest pony imaginable. Half Arab, he told me so, said Belinda. The pony had a new saddle and bridle, 
with a scarlet headband, a white sheepskin under the saddle, and he's Jem's own. They just keep him at the stables. If I had a pony like that, said Belinda, I would be happy forever. Would you, I wonder, said Mother, if you had to be Jem? When Nona and Belinda came to think of it, Jem did lead a queer life, restricted. Belinda tried to imagine what it would be like not to be free to run in and out of the house and garden. Jem was older than Belinda, but she was not even allowed to run as far as the pillar box at the corner to post a letter. Selwyn posted the letters. She never went on errands to the shops as Belinda loved to go. They give me sweets and apples, said Belinda. And Mr. Hancock, the fishmonger, sometimes let her ring up the cash register for him. Jem never went to the park to meet other children for games. She walked there beside Matson, and Mr. Tiffany Jones was right. She never seemed to play. Why doesn't she play? asked Belinda. He said he wished she could. Why doesn't she? Nona did not know, but perhaps she needs a Japanese doll, said Miss Happiness and Miss Flower. They could talk to one another, but of course nobody else could hear. The children had discovered that Matson was Jem's special maid. A maid for what? asked Belinda. To keep her rooms tidy, suggested Anne. Doesn't she have to tidy them herself? That made Belinda envious. And to look after her clothes, said Anne. Does she have so many clothes? That was another thing. Jem never seemed to wear the comfortable, ordinary clothes Nona and Belinda wore. Jeans or shorts and jerseys or a parka with a hood, a kilted skirt, hair tied up in a ponytail. She's always dressed up, said Belinda, dressed in elaborate dresses with ruffled petticoats in coats with white collars or trimmed with fur, in tailored suits. For riding, Jim wore jodhpurs, a white silk shirt, yellow waistcoat, smart tweed jacket, velvet cap, and dear little jodhpur boots. She had fur-trimmed boots and hats, spotless white gloves, and she had a real fur coat, like a lady's, only little, reported Belinda. More and more, Jem seemed like a girl in a book, and not a very truthful book, said Nona, because nowadays not even princes and princesses were treated like this. Princesses have to be friendly and smile and wave, said Belinda. Jem never smiled or waved, like her aunt. She did not seem to want to know the fells. They never saw her stand at her window and watch Nona and Belinda or peer through the hedge as they did. If she met them on the road, she looked the other way. Of course, she may not have been free to wave or smile. Everywhere she went, Matson followed her, like a policeman, said Belinda. Only policemen are nice, said Nona. Soon Nona and Belinda found themselves saying, poor Jem. How odd it was that Jem should be poor when she was so very rich. Mr. Tiffany Jones came back from Japan. Did he bring the little miss a Japanese doll? Miss Happiness and Miss Flower asked anxiously. No, it seemed he had only brought Jem a Japanese lantern. It was a beautiful lantern, big, of misty white paper with a black band, top and bottom. When it was lit, it glowed yellow. Nona, Belinda, and the dolls could see it hanging up in Jem's sitting room window. It looked most poetical, but Miss Happiness and Miss Flower were curiously disappointed. Belinda's best present at Christmas had been a pair of roller skates. Up till then, she had used Tom's old ones, dreadful ones that had the old kind of steel wheels, horribly noisy, said Anne, and were rigid without ball bearings, the grips worn out. They were always coming off and bringing Belinda down. The new ones were beautiful with leather heel grips, ball bearings, and hard rubber rollers. They were swift, almost noiseless, and on them, Belinda felt she flew. But if they are fast, they can be dangerous, Mother told her. You can go as fast as you like in the park or around the tennis courts, but you are not to go fast on the road. She let the children skate on the pavement of their own road because it was quiet, but they were not allowed to go up to the shops at its end. Mother did not know that they often skated round the corner into the next road that led to the park. You may skate slowly on our pavement, but if you go fast, I shall have to stop it, said Mother. On those new skates, Belinda could not help going fast. At least, she could not resist it. Besides, she and Tom had a secret game. They raced on opposite pavements, each side of the road. Tom gave Belinda a start, and they skated to the far end, away from the shops, and back again to their house. Tom had to turn around a pillar box at the corner of his pavement, Belinda round a lamppost. They both went furiously fast. But only when we see the road is empty, said Tom, or almost empty, said Belinda, who was not as careful as Tom. One or two people don't matter. Sometimes they did matter. Once, one of the people was Miss Tiffany Jones. Belinda had not realized who she was and shot past her, making Miss Tiffany Jones almost jump out of her skin. Child, you must not skate like that on a public road, she cried. Belinda, dragged, dragging her skate sideways, had managed to stop. How dare you, scolded Miss Tiffany Jones. 
I don't know where you come from. She seemed curiously blind to the Felses next door. But if I see you again, I shall tell the police. Why, you might give someone a heart attack. Scarlet in the face, her head sheepishly down, Belinda skated slowly away and stole in at her own gate, and for two whole days she did not skate on the road at all. She even carried her skates to the park, but Belinda was not very old, and when you are young, you forget. Besides, by far the most exciting place for skating was the road. On the third day, she was back again, but she kept a wary eye out for Miss Tiffany Jones. There's ice on the roads, said Father next morning at breakfast. Be careful how you walk and how you skate said mother. Better keep off the road, Belinda. If you get on a patch of ice, you might skid and not be able to stop. I can always stop, said Belinda. And if I can't, it's more fun. Not fun for other people, said Anne. Oh, I can always dodge them, said Belinda airily. It was wonderful skating that day. Tom and Belinda stayed in the park all the morning. It was almost lunchtime when they came back and the pavements were empty. They were in the road leading to their own and let's race home, said Belinda. What about the corner? asked Tom. The corner to their own road was sharp. Oh, there won't be anyone in there, said Belinda. We can swing round the lamppost. All right, give you 40 yards start, said Tom. And when they were stationed, ready, steady, go, called Tom. Belinda's skates were so good and she was skating so well that she was able to keep well ahead of Tom. She could hear him though coming behind her and I'm gonna get there first, she said through her teeth. The air was so cold and she was going so fast that her cheeks stung and her eyes were watering, but faster, 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 thought Belinda. She reached the corner, swung round the lamppost to turn, but did not really look as she gathered speed again, nor did she listen, or she would have heard Tom grind to a halt and shout, look out, Belinda, look out. Then suddenly in front of her, she saw the Tiffany Joneses, Mr., Miss, and Jem, their backs toward her, walking toward their front gate. They were strung so much across the pavement that there was no room for Belinda to pass. She tried to break, but she was going too fast. She tried to steer toward the wall and met exactly what Mother had warned her about, a patch of ice. The skates flew sideways. She spun round twice and pell-mell crash went into the back of Jem and sent her flying. Worse than that, skidding after her, Belinda lost her own balance, veered backwards and forwards, clutching at Jem. The skates flew up, one roller catching Mr. Tiffany Jones on the shin where she, he had whipped round to look. Then Belinda fell flat on her back on the ice, bringing Jem down on top of her. What a to-do there was. Mr. Tiffany Jones was hopping on one leg, swearing with pain. His black striped trousers had a great rip. Miss Tiffany Jones was half crying with shock and scolding in her high, loud voice. Tom, who had rushed up, was picking up Jem as well as he could with his skates on and trying to clean mud and ice from her coat while he told Belinda under his breath what he thought of her. Jem's white fur hat was lying in the road. Her muff was dangling on one string. The gold green hair was draggled with ice and mud and she was quite silent and white. She might have said something, said Belinda afterwards. Well, you knocked the breath out of her, said Tom. He left Jem to Miss Tiffany Jones and dragged Belinda to her feet. Belinda was too ashamed and shocked to say a word then, but Tom apologized though Miss Tiffany Jones hardly paused long enough to hear him. Perfect little hooligan, she was saying. I told her only the other day not to skate like this. She must be severely punished, she told Tom. It was partly my fault, said Tom. I let her race. Then you should be thoroughly ashamed of yourself. Oh, come, Agnes, it was an accident, said Mr. Tiffany Jones, who was beginning to recover. And Jem isn't hurt. Accident? Not hurt? The child looks stunned and sick. Then Miss Tiffany turned again on Belinda. Using the streets as a skating rink, you are a public danger. I would telephone your mother, but as she lets you play in the streets, I doubt if it would do much good. She swept Jem in at the gate. Mr. Tiffany Jones said, she will calm down by and by, and smiled and followed her. Tom took Belinda home. He was given a good talking to by my father, and both their skates were confiscated for a week. Mother wrote a note of apology to Miss Tiffany Jones and made Belinda, who could not bear writing letters, write one to Jem. This was a real punishment for Belinda, and even when she had written it three times, there were still blots. I bet Jem writes beautifully, she said, but that they could not know, because Jem did not answer, nor did Miss Tiffany Jones. That's not very gracious of them, said Father. Mr. Tiffany Jones still lifted his hat when he met Mother in the street. And he listened to me, said Anne. He still smiled, his wistful smile, and said, Hello, Tornado, in a most friendly way when he met Belinda. But Miss Tiffany Jones swept by with her head in the air. As for Jim, she walked straight past. She thinks I did it on purpose, said Belinda resentfully. I'm sure she doesn't, said Mother.
then she might at least smile, said Belinda. Anyone can smile. Do you smile at her? asked Mother. Certainly not, said Belinda. But why are the Tiffany Joneses like this? Why? she asked Mother. Different people have different ideas, said Mother, and bring their children up differently. Not as differently as this, said Belinda. Remember, Top Meadow is a new place for them, said Nona. Remember how silly I was when I first came? You were miserable, said Belinda, but you weren't stuck up. Then a thought struck her. The holidays were almost over. Soon it will be time for school, said Belinda. Jem will have to go to school. That will unstick her. But when term time came, Jem did not go to school. Instead, a number of new people came to the house next door. A lady came every day from half past nine until one. She was a proper governess, and her name, the children discovered, was Miss Berryman. The mademoiselle from their own school came twice a week to teach Jem French privately. But she knows French already, said Belinda. She can talk it. This was a mystery to Belinda, who was still struggling with avoir and être. A gentleman came three afternoons a week at half past four to teach Jem the piano. And she has to practice a whole hour every day, said Belinda. They could hear her on the little white piano and she's very good, said Anne, better than I am and I'm twice her age. Jem learned elocution and had private dancing lessons. Ballet twice a week, said Nona longingly. These seemed a great many lessons for one small girl. Chivied from morning to night, that's what she is, Belinda reported in the words of Mrs. Bodger. Nothing but putting clothes on and taking them off and practicing in lessons, lessons, lessons. Mother was disturbed at this. Every child should have some private time, she said. Time of her own, time for play. Perhaps Mr. Tiffany Jones felt this too. When Mother took Belinda to buy a new satchel, Belinda's first grown-up satchel, before she had only an old one of Anne's, and they met Mr. and Miss Tiffany Jones. Getting ready for school, he asked pleasantly. School has started, said Belinda, who was amazed that anyone living in Top Meadow should not know that. I didn't know, said Mr. Tiffany Jones, as if he had guessed what Belinda was thinking. You see, he said, Jem doesn't go to school. Not in Top Meadow, Miss Tiffany Jones broke in. Jem is a very gifted child, she said. She couldn't go to an ordinary school. Come, Harold, and she put her hand on Mr. Tiffany Jones's arm and marched him away. Nona had made Miss Happiness and Miss Flower go to school, too. A school by themselves, she said. I wish they knew another Japanese child. She had made tiny writing books for the dolls bound in the Japanese way, pleated into pages that can be opened out into one long scroll. You begin on the last page and work back to the first. Japanese characters are written with a brush and not a pen. Nona made the smallest possible brushes from a splinter of a match and a piece of a feather and copied some Japanese characters onto a dollhouse blackboard for the dolls to copy and write. Japanese is such a different language that in Japan, children spend almost all their time learning to read and write. But she made each of the dolls learn a haiku, too. One day, you shall say them to the Honorable Mr. Tiffany Jones, she told them, and the dolls felt pleased. Miss Happiness's haiku was, You stupid scarecrow, under your very stick feet, birds are stealing beans. Well, Miss Flowers was this. Gay butterflies, be careful of pine needle points in the gusty wind. When Mother saw Mr. Tiffany Jones on the road, she always stopped and asked, How is your wife? Getting on, getting on, I hope, said Mr. Tiffany Jones, but he did not sound at all hopeful. He sounded wistful. He seemed to like watching Belinda and Nona with Mother, though when he saw the way Nona hung on her arm and heard Belinda's chatter, his face would grow more wistful than ever. I wish Jem could be with her mother like this, he said one day. When she does see her, she treats her as a stranger. But you take Jem to see her often, said Mother. Well, no, said Mr. Tiffany Jones. Agnes, my sister, says it would be too distressing. You don't think so? He added, looking at Mother's face. It is distressing for a little girl not to see her mother, said Mother. But perhaps Mrs. Tiffany Jones will be coming home soon. I should like her to, but Agnes says it would be too difficult. And he sighed. Difficult? With all those servants? Said Anne, when he had walked on. If you ask me, Miss Tiffany Jones liked bossing that lovely house and doesn't want to give it up. But... You are not to gossip about things you cannot know, said Mother. We do know, said Anne. Anyone can see it, and she likes bossing Jem, too. Why doesn't he tell her not to? Agnes says, Agnes says, mocked Anne. Don't, Anne, said Mother. You mustn't criticize the poor man. He's driven half out of his senses with worry. End of chapter 3